right, so welcome, let's pray. Um, we will give this time to the Lord and look to him in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day. Lord, thank you for the faithfulness that you always show us. You're faithful to your word. And Lord, we've gathered in your mighty name here this morning and you've promised to meet us here. So we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. We ask that you would be lifted up, that you would be magnified, that your word would be held high. And Lord, we know it's all about you. It's not about a, a man or a ministry. It's all about you, Lord. And we wanna grow in the grace and in the knowledge of you. So Lord, as we continue our series in growing in the grace of God, Father, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would speak to every heart that would, uh, that's here and that would even watch. Lord, we just pray that your word would go forth in power and accomplish what you purpose as you say you will, that your word will accomplish that which you've purposed it to do. It will not return to you void. And so Lord, we rejoice in what you've done and what you're doing. God, we rejoice in this amazing grace that we have because of your, your life, your death, your resurrection, your empowering of us by the Holy Spirit, and it's all according to your grace. And we're so grateful for it, Lord. So please be glorified in our time this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, as I said, we are continuing our study in growing in the grace of God. Uh, our study today, study number two is called The Grace of God. And I've got up here a list of our topics. So you can just kind of see what we've covered and what is coming up. We covered last week, the law of God today, the grace of God. Then we're gonna look at living daily by the grace of God the Holy Spirit and the grace of God, grace for knowing God, and the much more grace of God. And this is all in line with Pastor Bob Hoekstra's study on growing in the grace of God. Pastor Bob is with the Lord, uh, just a great, mighty man of God. God used him in a powerful way. He used to teach in the Bible colleges, uh, Calvary Chapel. He used to pastor his own fellowship for quite a while. And I just personally, I knew him. I wasn't super, super close to him, but I knew him personally. And he's just, he's a breath of fresh air, this guy. <laughs> he's just really a sweet man of God. Uh, I believe his ministry is called Living in Christ Ministries. And there, you know, the ministry lives on. There's things that you can uh, go to his website and uh, be involved with. It's just really, really some good stuff. And this is, stuff that I've learned that I've gone through over the years. Uh, and it's just so appropriate for this type of a study where we are um, living in these foundational truths, the, the, the foundations in our faith. It just fits in so very well. All right, so anyway, that's our, uh, that's our list of topics. Now, if you remember, for those of you that were here last week, and if you weren't, you can go back and watch online if you so desire. We covered the law of God. Now, the law of God is pretty tough subject. <laughs> you know, I mean, and obviously because of what it demands, you know, we looked at it, I'll briefly recap it, but it really reminded me a lot of my time when I first read through the Bible. Because when I picked up the Bible and I started to read the word of God, um, I read it as it is a book. So I went from Genesis to Revelation. It took me a year to get through it. And uh, by the time I got to the New Testament, I was so ready for Jesus. <laughs> I didn't realize it because I, you know, I'd never read the Gospels. I'm just reading the Bible and it was all predicated on, okay, God, if you're real, prove your existence to me. I wasn't being facetious or anything. I was just honestly saying, God, just, I don't believe in you. But if you exist, prove it to me, Lord. And I just picked up the Bible and started to read it in 1979. I finished it in one year. By the time I got to the New Testament, as I said, I was so ready for Christ. His love, his compassion, his wisdom, his power, everything about him, I remember, even though it was 44 years ago, 45 now, I remember I would say, how can anybody not see 
reading the Gospels that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. How can people not see that? And it was just so amazing to me. And so this is what the law and now the grace kind of put together reminds me of because after we studied the law of God last week, we should be really ready for a study on the grace of God. <laughs> and I think you're going to see that as we go. We're familiar with a lot of things of grace and maybe not as many things as we should be. But there's a scripture that I would like to refer to here. And it's in 2 Peter 3.18, where we have the exhortation to actually grow in God's grace. It says there, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Peter wrote that. God wrote that through Peter. There's an exhortation for us here to grow in grace. So just in the way of recap of last week, we looked at four different points concerning the law last week. The first one was the law's message. And if you remember it, the law's message is be righteous, be holy, be perfect. But it didn't really just stop there, right? It was like, as God is. So, you know, the Bible in the Old Testament said, be holy for I am holy. We know that righteousness is something that God desires in it, but it in us, but it can't come from the law. And then when Jesus was speaking in the Mount of Beatitudes, he said, therefore, be thou perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And right there, you're just done, right? You're like, that ain't going to happen. The bar is way too high. So when you saw what the law's message was, it became, it can become very disheartening. The second thing we looked at was the law's inability. There are things, obviously, that the law cannot do. The things that we looked at was simply that the law cannot make us righteous. The law cannot uh, uh, justify us. And we're going to talk a little bit about justification because it's in our text today. Um, justify means not guilty. You're just proclaimed not guilty. So the law can't make us not guilty. It cannot make us righteous. And it cannot sanctify us. And we're going to spend a lot of time as we go through the whole rest of this series on this topic of sanctification, because it's not, as many people think, just to be set apart. Yes, it's to be set apart, but there's a purpose in that. Just like anything that you would set aside, you have a purpose for setting something aside. And so God, when he sanctifies us, he sets us apart for the purpose of being holy. And if you remember, the, the root word to sanctify or sanctification is hagios, which means holiness. So God sets us apart on this trek, on this journey of sanctification, where we are being changed day by day into the image of Christ, which the Bible teaches us these things. Now, obviously, the law cannot sanctify us, and it cannot bring us from under the bondage of sin. And this is really, really important because we know that we have a sin problem. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But see, the law cannot set us free from the bondage to sin. We know, and I have it on your notes there in, in um, I believe it's in Galatians 2, where it says, I do not set aside the grace of God because if righteousness comes from the works of the law, then Christ died in vain. And this is such an important scripture to remember because there are many people outside of the church that actually believe the way you will be accepted by God is by doing good things. So they look at you and me as Christians as like, you guys are supposed to be perfect. So when you're out of line, you're blowing it. You're a hypocrite or whatever. Well, I'm blowing it every day. I'm a sinner all the time. But see, I don't have my righteousness imputed to me from the things that I do. It is by the grace of God. And you'll see that as we go through this study. So we're familiar with God's grace that it, it brings new life. And it also sets us free from sin, as I just mentioned. And I'm going to talk just a little bit more about that as we go. But notice the scripture here in Romans 6, it says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So this is something that 
is important for those in Christ and especially those new in Christ to realize we're not under the law, we're under God's grace. But as we talked last week, that doesn't mean we throw the law away. The law is holy, righteous, just, good, nothing wrong with the law. Where was the problem? Right here. <laughs> Romans 8 says the law was weak through the flesh. So it all comes back to me. It all comes back to you. So the weakness of the law was us. It's our flesh. The law is good. But nevertheless, God tells us we're not to, have, we're not to be dominated by sin for the simple fact we're not under the law. We are living under his grace. So the third thing that we talked about last week was the law's abilities. Now, the law has a lot of abilities. It reveals God's character, it reveals his standards, it reveals his will. It actually reveals a way that God desires to govern man. You know, the United States built their governing principles in the beginning on the word of God because they knew that the word of God was a righteous standard uh, that God had set forth to govern man, that there would be justice, fairness, equity, if you want to call it. Uh, there, there would just be everything in order. God put his law out there to govern man. So that was one of the great abilities. We also looked at the fact that the law has the ability to silence every mouth. Every mouth will be silenced when they stand before God one day. And I know you've probably heard people think or say, you know, I'm a, if I stand before God, I'm going to let him know a thing or two. No, you're not. <laughs> you're going to be prostrate on your face. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So the, the law of God can uh, silence every mouth and does silence every mouth because we're all sinners. And the law's fulfillment is another thing that we looked at. And the law's fulfillment is simply one word, and it is Jesus. So Jesus, you know, he came, he died, he fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law. He fulfilled the penalty for the law, which was death. He rose again, and then he sent the Holy Spirit down to come and live inside of us, to empower us, to live the life and do the things that we could never do, which is everything. <laughs> You know, we just totally need him for all things. Even Paul said, aside from Christ, I can do nothing. And I, I take him very literally. He realized he needed the Lord in everything that he did. So this idea of the law's fulfillment is found in Jesus. It's very, very key. I want you to look at this scripture one more time with me in Romans 3. Verses 21 through 24 say, but now the righteousness of God apart from the laws revealed being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe for there's no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I've highlighted a couple of things here. First of all, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're ever asked, you know, hey, what's your relationship with the law? I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. Well, then what do you do about righteousness? Jesus took care of it for me. The righteousness of God's been imputed to me. It's apart from the law and it's all predicated on his grace. And it's witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, the word of God bears witness to this fact. The next thing is that it's all predicated on faith in Jesus Christ. And notice it says there too that we are being we've been justified freely by his grace. In other words, we're pronounced not guilty all because of God's grace. So this is really... Very important to remember as you're growing in the Lord, we're not under the law, we're under God's grace. Doesn't give us a license to sin. We love the law, the law is holy, righteous, just, and good. But see, we're not being made righteous by our obedience to the law, to works, or anything else. Jesus did that for us by his perfect sinless life and dying and raising again. All right, so here's our four points in our topic today. They're in your notes there. 
The first one is grace, not the law. The second one is God's justifying grace. Third, God's sanctifying grace. And then the last one is living by grace. And that's kind of, you're going to see this process of sanctification day by day. It just goes right on and should go right on through our lives. So let's dive in, take a look at it. Okay, point number one, grace and not the law. And there's a contrast here we're bringing out in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. And it says, and of his, that is Jesus's, of Jesus's fullness, we have all received in grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So what a contrast here in the very first chapter of the Gospel of John. You remember how that chapter starts? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him, and aside from Him was not anything made that was made. That's pretty plain. You jump down to verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We know who he's talking about, Jesus. And so John goes on and says here in the scripture that we've just read that the law came through Moses, but grace came, grace and truth came from Jesus Christ. And he begins to show the supremacy of grace over the law of God. Moses was the lawgiver. He was a picture of the law, but Jesus is a picture of the grace and the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, people do try to find words that are synonymous with grace. And I hope that as you go through this study, you're gonna realize that grace is a whole lot bigger than you even think it is. Um, remember, what was his name? John Newton that wrote the song, Amazing Grace. He was the slave trader. And his song is, I, I mean, is one of the most powerful songs on grace that anybody's ever heard. Now, I don't know, I'm going to share this with you later in the series because it just kind of got on my heart today, but there's a song written by Mercy Me and it's called Grace Amazing. And I'm going to show you some of the lyrics and stuff in there unless you want to just go and listen to it. But this song, to me, is almost on parallel with Amazing Grace that was written way, way back. All the lyrics are just mind-blowing it's, a, it's just an amazing, amazing song. So people try to get a, cinema, a, sin, a, a word that is synonymous with grace. And a lot of people say forgiveness because what is grace? Well, grace is getting what you don't deserve, right? We'd say, yeah. And we looked at that acronym, remember last week, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Yeah, that, that fits good. But what it is, is you need to see, we need to see and we will see as we go, that grace is so much bigger than that. Grace is so much bigger than forgiveness. Are grace and forgiveness equal? I put this up here. The answer is just simply no. Grace is greater. And you're gonna see that as we go. Now, I've got a quote here from Pastor Bob Hoekstra, and this is his definition of grace. Now, somebody who's taught so much on grace, like this guy, I really take note to what he says. This is what Pastor Bob says about grace in way of definition. He says, the grace of God is God freely providing for us through the person and work of his son as we humbly trust in his son, all that we need, all that we would yearn for, all that we are commanded to walk in and become, but could never produce on our own, could never earn it from God, and could never deserve it even, I threw that in there, if he gave it to us. This is his definition of grace. Grace is so much bigger than our perception, and it's not just his opinion, but you're gonna see as we go through this, the word of God makes that very, very, very plain. All right, so our second point now is God's justifying grace. We've, we've looked at Romans 3, and we're going to look at a portion of it again right here. But notice how the Christians are described as those who have been freely justified by God's grace. That's what it says right there. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So 
Again, the idea of justification is not guilty. You are righteous in the sight of God because of God's grace. You've been freely justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and his redemptive work for you. And we will talk about that just a little bit more in a minute. Another scripture here in Ephesians, it says in him, that's in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Now notice in these two scriptures, there's two words here I wanna draw your attention to, and it's redemption. If you remember, redemption means to buy back. What does that imply? That implies that you owned it. How can you buy something back that wasn't yours? You can't. And see, only Christ, I love to make this point, that only Christ could redeem us because he's the only one that owned us. And I, I know I've shared the story of the little boy in the boat. Pastor Chuck uses the gingerbread man. And I won't go into all of that, but just suffice it to say that he created all things and aside from him was not anything made that was made, speaking of Jesus, so he owned us. And we went away from him as we uh, got lost in our own sinful ways or whatever. Maybe at a very young age, you walked away. Maybe at a teenage age, you walked away or when you got into college and your, uh, your professors in there convinced you that God's not real and it's all a bunch of hokey pokey or whatever. But people go away from God. But see, God created you. He, he owns you. Jesus owns you. He made you. The Bible makes this very clear in other places, and I won't belabor the point. But nevertheless, to buy us back, you had to own it. Only Jesus owned it, owned us. And so when he died in our place, he came, he fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law. He never sinned. How many people do you know have never sinned? Now you're gonna run into some that might say so. <laughs> but the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus said, I always do those things that please my father. Now, if somebody were to say that to me, I'd say, dude, you're really deceived. Your heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, <laughs> you know. No, Jesus always did those things. Which of you convinces me or convicts me of sin? Jesus would say. Nobody could convict him because he was without spot, without blemish, without sin. He was holy and he was righteous. And so when he died, the penalty for sin was death. He died. He created us. He can redeem us, buy us back. He's the near kinsman redeemer. You know the story in uh, Ruth. You know, if you lost your property, it could always be bought back, but it would go to whoever was near kinsman, the first in line. It would be the near kinsman redeemer. They call that the Goel. There's only one near kinsman redeemer for mankind. His name is Yeshua. His name is Jesus. And he's the only one who could redeem us, buy us back to God by his death, his resurrection. And so this is very, very important to remember this idea of redemption. We've been redeemed. We've been brought, uh, bought back to God. Um, so notice here too, before we move on, it speaks of the riches of his grace. That implies that his grace has an abundance in it. So here the word of God is showing us that there's much more to grace then maybe just our initial thought of it. You know, I'm saved by grace. Yeah, it's brought new life. Well, yeah, it's done that, but it does so very much more. And part of what it does, and actually probably the, the most main thing, I would say, for lack of a better way to phrase it, is the way that it sanctifies us that brings us into the third topic, which is God's sanctifying grace. So let's look at Titus 2, 11 and 12 here. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, that's Christ, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age. So again, sanctification is the idea of a process. It's being set apart for a purpose it's a process to be made holy. So we see right here in the word of God, there's a couple of uh, 
there's a couple of cool things mentioned here, and I'm going to come back to them, but I want you to, well, I'll put this scripture up there because it's kind of like our theme scripture. We've already read it, that we are to grow in the grace of God. So growing, obviously, is a process. Sanctification is a process. It doesn't just come to us at once. It is something that just continually happens in our lives. And we're going to see how that happens uh, in just a minute. So this scripture here in Acts actually is the one that gives us a couple of insights, um, a couple of aspects of God's grace that are mentioned here. I'm going to bring them up here in a minute. In Acts 20, 32, it says, So now, brethren, I, com I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So here there's two things mentioned. One we're very familiar with, and it is the inheritance. But the other thing, and I say that just because once you're, once you're born again, we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, lest any man should boast. So we're saved by grace through faith, not of anything that we did, it's the gift of God. So we, we're familiar with grace being how we came into the family of God. And when you come into the family of God, you've got an inheritance. You're an heir with Christ. You're a joint heir with Christ. He's uh, going to take us home one day and we're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. I mean, when you stop to think about the inheritance that we have, it's, it's just mind boggling. But we're, we're familiar with that. But notice here it also says that um, aside from this inheritance, it also says that it is able to build us up. So it's a work that God's grace does um, as he builds us up. Let's look at a warning here um, concerning God's sanctifying grace. There's a warning for the heart here. It, it says in Hebrews 13, 9, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines for it is good that the heart be established by grace not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. So Hebrews here gives us a warning. Don't be carried around by strange teachings. That's teachings that are alien to the word of God. So this is kind of the idea. We talked actually a lot about some strange teachings when we went through contending for the faith. Some teachings are not only strange, they're just heretical. They're just not even part of God's plan. But there are some really strange things out there, and I won't get into some of them. A lot of crazy things are out there. But the main purpose of growing, of sanctification, is to be established in the Word of God. It says that it is good for the heart to be established by grace. I know he mentions foods and everything, and we know that back in the early church, they were having a problem. What do you do with the law? We're under the new covenant. We're not under the law. We're under this new covenant. Yeah, but what do you do with the laws? You still got to go to, you got to keep Sabbath. You got to get circumcised. You can only eat certain foods. And so this was a big struggle and rightfully so with the early church. And so when he's making this statement here, it's good for the heart to be established by grace and not be hung up on foods that have profited uh, none of those that are uh, preoccupied with them. That's all this is a relation to here. But the fact is it is good for the heart to be established by grace. And that is the point that he's making. Establishing is this idea of sanctification. It's the process that on goes. And I think that we would all agree that the heart is a major issue. In Proverbs, it says, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Out of your heart, out of my heart, come forth the issues of life. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Jesus tells us. So the heart is really an important issue. And of course, we know uh, that the heart is very deceitful. Matter of fact, the Bible says the heart is deceitful, what? Above all things. <laughs> it doesn't just say deceitful. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We're told that in Jeremiah. We're also told in the Psalms in a couple of places, whoever trusts in his heart is a fool. And I hear people say a lot, well, just trust in your heart. No, you, you can trust in your heart, but that's if it's in line with the word of God. Our trust is in the word of God. The heart is a very, very critical issue. 
All right, so now we're coming to our last point, which is living by grace. And I put this question up here, how do we live day by day by the grace of God? And this is something that people have asked, not to me, but Pastor Bob had been asked this quite a bit. And so he addressed this. Um, to have a better understanding of grace, that it's just not how we're saved, but how we also grow. This is why this question pops up. And there are two things important godly virtual virtues that grow in our lives as we are in the sanctification pro process and it's all predicated on relationship both of these virtues i'm going to mention they're predicated on relationship so what you put into a relationship is what you're going to get out of it i mean you can think of any relationship that's special to you it can be with your dog it could be with your sister, your brother, your mother, your father, a close friend. But see, whatever we put into a relationship is what we will get out of the relationship. We will probably have a very dynamic relationship with our husbands, with our wives, with our kids, if we're pouring into them. So these virtues are relational. The first one is referred to in James 4, verse 6. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So this first virtue you see right here is simply this, it's humility, because God resists the proud person, but he gives grace unto the humble. And so humility is really to say, I can't do it. God, I need your help. God, I, I, I need more of you and less of me. And so to be humble, to live in humility is really as I said, it's relational because as you walk with the Lord, as you live in his word and you see your life in the light of God's word, you find out that you're really just a penny looking for change. <laughs> I mean, that's the best way I could explain it. You remember Job? You know, Job was like, you know, if I could ask God a few things, I'd ask him this or that. And you go through the whole book of Job and you're reading it, you realize this guy hasn't done anything wrong, but still he's a little bit up upset he's a little frustrated and rightly so nobody's gone through what he's gone through and this guy he was really having a hard time and you know he basically when he stood before God God said to him who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge in other words who do, who are you Job you think you know what you're talking about let me ask you a few questions prepare yourself like a man answer me where were you when I and have you seen beyond the gates of death? And on and on and on. That part of the scripture is so powerful, so insightful. But Job, what's his reply? You know, I spoke about that which I did not know. And now that I, I see you, uh, I, I zip the lip, so to speak. I repent in dust, in ashes. That's humility. That was Job. And it was all predicated on his relationship with God. He had a relationship with God like, like nobody else. And when we see ourselves in the light of God's word, we realize that we're nothing and that he is everything. So humility is this first virtue, relational virtue that grows as we live in Christ, in his grace. The second one is out of Romans 5, 1 through 2 here. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And I know you've already read ahead on your notes. The answer there is faith. This is the second virtue that is relational that grows. And this doesn't need a lot of explaining it's kind of like as you walk with God and God shows up and does something that you just can't believe what he does, what happens? Your faith grows. I like the idea of Paul and Silas. They go uh, down there into, uh, I don't know if it was Thessalonica or Philippi it was in that journey. And uh, they got beat, thrown in jail. And uh, midnight, they're singing songs. They're praising God, you know. <laughs> and what happens? Well, all the bars fall open, the chains fall off, you can come in. You're welcome. Uh, you know, I mean, God just shows up in a huge way. He shows up in such a big way. So then they go down. I think that was in Philippi. Then they go down to Thessalonica. Do you think their faith might have grown a little bit? You see what God did back there? Oh, dude, 
I got some fresh boldness. I got some fresh purpose. <laughs> I got some fresh drive and desire, you know, because their faith grew and it is all relational, predicated on their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I, I could share with you some things in my life that God did, because I've been thinking over my life at some miracles that God has done in my life. And it's just, it's been so profound to me, but I don't, I know we're out of time and I don't want to take the time. Maybe in the future, I will share with you some things. So um, these are just so important. You know, as we live in the word, Jesus said, if you make my word your home, he said, abide in my word. If you abide in my word, you'll be my disciple. Indeed, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free from the bondage to sin. In context, in John chapter eight, so as we live in Christ, we live in his word, and he just begins to transform us. We realize we're justified. We're set free from the law of sin and death. His righteousness is imputed to us because of what he did. You see, humility says, I can't do it. And faith says, I depend on somebody else to do it. I, I just need you, Lord, completely and totally. And you know, I really love this part right here. It's actually in my little concluding slide here. So I'll save it for the end. In conclusion, we're under grace. We're not under the law. We're justified, declared not guilty by God's grace. We are sanctified. We're set apart. We're in a process of growing in God's grace. Um, so sanctification is by God's grace. And then this last one was right out of that last scripture. In grace, we stand and rejoice in the hope that we have in Christ. We stand in grace, we rejoice in grace because of what Jesus has done and is doing in and through our lives. And so as we go through the rest of this study, it's really right along the line of this sanctification process, how grace is at work in our lives and what God does in it and through it. So let's pray and thank God for the time. Lord, again, thank you so much, Lord, for this time, this wonderful day that you've given us. God, thank you for the church that we belong to. God, I know it's your church. We know it's your church, God. And I, I'm just so grateful that your word is taught here with Pastor Dave, Pastor Josh, uh, the, the Sunday school teachers, everybody involved here, God. We want your word to be lifted high. We know it's all about you, Lord. We're a blessed people. God, we're a blessed people in this nation that you've given us. And Lord, we're, as you know, we're in trouble here, Lord. This nation needs you, God, please. Would you turn us back to you? Lord, let us turn back to your word. We know that you desire to govern your people, God. And Lord, the things that are going on here in the country, you know them full well. And I, I just see a little glimpse of it. And I know we're in trouble, God. Would you pour out the spirit of grace and supplication upon us that we would look upon you whom we've pierced, that we would weep and mourn for you as for our firstborn. God, we pray the same for the nation of Israel, the things that are going on there. We know Israel is your people. Israel is your land. You say, that's my land. You see the heartache and the turmoil that is there, not only among the the Israeli people, but among all of those that don't even believe in you, God, we know you love them all. So God, pour out the spirit of grace and supplication upon them to snatch many of them, Lord, out of the fire, so to speak, turn their hearts and their minds to you. So Lord, we love you again. We thank you for this day. I thank you for these people that are here, though I don't know them. I don't know them like you do. God, I thank you for them and I pray that you would open up their eyes. You would strengthen and encourage their hearts. God, I pray that you would fill them fresh with your Holy Spirit and that you would just give them divine appointments as they go. You would bring healing. You would bring peace. You would bring strengthening. You would bring disciplining. God, whatever you want to do, Lord, we ask you to do what you know needs to be done because God, I know in this process of sanctification, God, you're preparing us for the future and you know what lies down the road. So Lord, let us be strong, strong in the grace, strong in the confidence that we have in you. And we trust you for these things, God, now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.